today. And be, there'll be a lot of, probably about half the sermon today, there'll be a lot of uh, the introduction and opening up of Philippians here. So uh, let's read in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There goes Paul thinking again. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I'm in chains or, de and de or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray together. God, we do thank you that we get to open up your word again. We pray that you would open up our minds, our hearts, uh, to receive what it is that you uh, the Holy Spirit speaking to us uh, today, and that we can not just be excited, but we can go out and follow. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Well, we know. Uh, I think I think a lot of us know in here that Philippians has a nickname, the Epistle of what? Joy, the Epistle of Joy. And it's a very uh, unique letter, uh, with the exception of Thessalonians and the real small book of Philemon. Um, Philippians is really, you would say, the only, outside of those two, the only personal letter of Paul uh, in, our, in our holy sacred scripture. This is seen in the introduction, in the introduction, because he says, uh, in the way that he, uh, he, he, he speaks of himself, his title, he doesn't say Paul the Apostle, right? And with many of his other letters, he used his title as the Apostle so that um, those that are reading, those that are hearing the letter, as it was read in those days, uh, would respect uh, the calling and uh, listen up to what he had to say. But here, uh, he doesn't use apostle. Uh, he uses a different title. Uh, he says, not servant. We, we read servant, but really that should be translated as slave. Uh, the, the Greek word for servant is diakonos. That's where we get deacon from, right? Uh, but the, the Greek word that is used here uh, is actually doulos, which means slave. Uh, but it's put in there because uh, uh, whenever the King James was first written, uh, it was a very sensitive word to use then, but it just kind of uh, stayed in there. So, but anyhow, it, it should read slave. So he didn't use title of Apostle, even though he was, he didn't deny that he was an apostle, but he, he used the title slave, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ. And why would he do that? Why would he say slave of Christ? Uh, well, that would do two things, two of, uh, one of two things. First, it would be, it would show that he is the absolute possession of Christ, that he was bought at a price, right? Slaves were bought. He was bought with the blood of Jesus. We are all bought. We are blood-bought believers. We are, we are bought at the, by the blood of Jesus. We're his possession. And then second, uh, that he wasn't living for his will anymore, but the will of the master. The will of the master. So we'll go, we'll, we'll go through Philippians, and we'll see that Paul, he was thankful and joyful, not because of his circumstances, but actually despite his circumstances. Uh, and I think a lot of reason of, of that is, uh, even though he was in prison and he is still able to be thankful and joyful, it's because he did see himself. He knew he was a slave of Christ. 
who didn't get to choose to do whatever he wanted, but he sought to do the will of the master. Uh, a servant, right, has rights. You know, I can be a servant. I can kind of serve God any way I want. But when I view myself as a slave of Christ, I say, I want to get rid of my rights. I want God to have all rights over me. Just think about it. Whenever I feel, when I start to get entitled and think I'm entitled to all these rights, what eventually happens? Big letdown, big disappointment, grumbling, frustration. But when I say I don't have any rights, I'm just going to go where the master says. And we get, and get surprised by joy. Get surprised, wow, this is greater than I ever thought it would be. Uh, being a slave, not of sin, but of being a slave of the master, Jesus uh, who brings us the best that life can give, the best that any, any life that you can get, eternal life, and from the one who has our very best interest at heart. So Paul called himself slave here. He didn't, he didn't do that too often, but he did it here. But what does he call those that, are, that he's writing to? What does he call them? Saints, which means what? Holy ones. Holy ones, anyone that is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a saint. You are a holy one. Uh, not because you're an angel. Because of whose angel you are. Or who you are in Christ. You, you belong to the holy, to the holy one. Uh, as holy ones, we, we are not holy because of how perfect and pure our conduct is. We know that just waking up this morning, Right? But we're holy because of whose we are in Christ and who and what we're called to. If we look at the Old Testament and when that word holy is used, this will help us understand. Uh, the Jews were God's holy nation, right? The priests were holy and set apart for what? Special service, weren't they? In the temple. The tithe was holy because it was set apart. Uh, not for just regular old food or whatnot, but it was set apart for temple service. So when we think of holy, think of different, set apart, set apart for something special, uh, set apart for, for God and his services. See, we, as God's saints, as his holy ones, uh, we are to be a peculiar people, right? Not weird. That doesn't mean you have to be weird. Uh, now, there's weird Christians, and I, maybe I'm one of them on your, in your sight. But it doesn't mean, peculiar doesn't mean weird. It means, hmm, something you don't see every day. Uh, a little different, unusual, not ordinary, but extraordinary. Uh, what type of love uh, we share with others, something we don't see every day. Uh, think about, I mean, our master, he was unordinary, right? He was something you didn't see every day. You would expect God... Uh, if he came down from heaven, right, he would want everybody to serve him. But what did he do? He came to serve, and he gave his life as a ransom. That's unusual. He wouldn't expect the God of the universe to come, the one who deserves all praise and all glory, to come and, be, and, and to serve, and serve by dying on the cross. That's unusual. And for us as the holy ones, as the saints, as we sacrifice our lives, we give up things for the sake of the gospel. That's unusual to the world. Not just giving up your time, but actually giving up your I, I think of VBS. For how often you ladies and guys who have helped with v, VBS, you give your time. But not just that, you actually give money towards it. Usually, like with services, you get paid to do the service. It's volunteer work. I love, love for Christ. And when we have a fundraiser during PBS, you're giving your own money as well. You're paying to work for Jesus. That's unusual, but that's what happens when you have Christ in your heart and he's changed your, your life and he's wiped away your sin. Uh, we live a peculiar life, holy life, uh, because it's set apart for a holy purpose, a special purpose, which is in, in Christ, uh, to lead people to him. So Paul calls them saints, holy ones, but that's not it. Saints in what? In Christ. Saints in Christ Jesus. That's a term that Paul used often in his writings. And many of the, our New Testament, we'll read uh, 48 times he says the word, referring to Christians, 48 times he says in Christ Jesus. 
and then 34 times in Christ, 50 times in the Lord. The Philippians were facing some apparent trials. If you read the end of chapter 1, they were suffering for Christ, and Paul says they were going through a similar struggle as he had. So they were going through some trial, and uh, they needed to be reminded that no matter what crisis they are in, their, their in crisis is trumped by their in Christ. No matter what my in is, in trouble, in financial distress, in emotional distress, uh, in prison, maybe as Paul was for his faith, no matter what my in is, uh, my in Christ trumps it. And that's also why he was able to have joy. And be thankful because even in prison, right, his in prison uh, was trumped by his in Christ. And that's why he was able to maintain joy uh, and be thankful in all things. Because he kept his eyes on Christ and was reminded that he is in Christ and no one can take him out. Right? No one can separate him from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, but geographically, where were these people? Where were the Philippians? They were in Philippi. Philippi, uh, just Roman soldiers, retired Roman, Roman soldiers uh, that lived there. They, and then so you see a lot of people dressed like Romans, speaking like Romans. Uh, it was a Roman colony. And when, and when Paul first visited it, it was in, uh, we read of it in Acts 16. When he first visited Philippi, it was his uh, second missionary journey. And, when he, and if we read in Acts 16, that first time he visited, there were three conversions. Three conversions of three very different people. Different nationality, totally different economic status. Three different people. We see Lydia, right? She was a dealer in what? Purple cloth, which was very expensive, right? Who do you sell to usually? Royalty, right? So she was very wealthy. So we got Lydia, very wealthy, and from Asia. And then we got the Roman jailer. Uh, he was middle class and obviously from Rome. And then the slave girl, very poor, a nobody, and a Greek. Three very different people, di three very different nation nationalities and economic status. But all of them came to Christ through Paul, uh, which is a reminder uh, that the gospel is for all people. Not just that person that I think might be able to come into the kingdom. It is for all People. We should never say the Holy Spirit can't lead me to that person to lead them to Christ because they're different than me or they're different than what I expect them to be. Uh, he can do it for all people. He does it for all people. We see with, with Lydia, Rome, this Roman jailer and slave girl. So if Paul's very first visit to Philippi, we see that uh, the Holy Spirit can use us to lead anyone to Christ. Uh, with, uh, with that brief introduction to Philippians, uh, here, our title, as I said, is uh, Shining as stars for our series. And like I said, not so we, we can be seen, like Hollywood, but so Christ can be seen in us, so we can shine uh, in the darkness uh, as we hold on, as we trust in the word of life, as Paul says it, uh, and do so with a joy uh, that the world can't give, right? Or take away, as we trust in him. Uh, I got a picture here for you guys. Um, let me see, I, tell you, I just lost my sermon here for a second. But we have a picture here. While I'm looking for my sermon, anybody want to take a shot at a what structure this is? What is it? Good guess, but it's not. I'll be honest, I didn't know what it was either when I found it, all right? Uh, this is uh, the Sagrada... Familia Church. Anybody want to guess where it's at? I'll give you a second shot. It is in Barcelona. Barcelona. That, that's the best. I mean, that's what I would have said. I would have said Rome. So the Sagrada Familia Church in Barcelona, it says, uh, has received a lot of prestigious recognition despite being a work in progress since 18, not, eight, not 19, but 1882. Not only has it been designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it's also been visited by the Pope and proclaimed a basilica. 
which for Catholic churches is kind of like winning the Super Bowl. The Sagrada Familia is the brainchild of the famous architect Antoni Gaudi, who spent most of his life building it up into this grotesque, nature-inspired work of art it is today. Tragically, he passed away in 1926 after being hit by a tram. His masterpiece at that point was less than a quarter complete. But it's been carried on ever since, inspired by Gaudi's vision and funded almost exclusively by millions of tourists who flock there every year. Today, the Sagrada Familia is more than halfway done. This is about 100 years halfway done, right? With an optimistic completion date of 2026, the centennial of Gaudi's death. Barring that, the current head architect is confident that it will be finished perhaps in less than a century. So keep your calendar open, they say. So the Sagrada Familia Church, obviously it's an unfinished church. It's unfinished. Uh, we as God's saints, as the holy ones, his father was on the porch waiting for him and ran to me. As soon as he made that step back, he's like, all right, we'll just pick up right where we left off. Uh, so we, our text, we were, we were reminded, uh, if we, you may think, that you may have blown it, right, uh, completely, uh, and that God's going to give up on you. No. Uh, he says, he who began a good work in you will complete it. He's not going to give up. He, as we repent and turn back to him, pick up right where we left off. Uh, Jerry Bridges, anybody heard of Jerry Bridges? Or maybe the book Discipline of Grace. He wrote the book Discipline of Grace. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, he says, our worst days are never so bad that we are beyond the grip of God's grace. And our best days are never so good that we are beyond the need of God's grace. No matter how high uh, I may get in pride, be reminded it's only because of he who began. Because of God and his grace uh, that I may be strong in the Lord as I see myself. Or no matter how low I may get, uh, thinking it's all over and I'm losing all hope, be reminded that he who began will complete it. He will be completed and see that it is finished. Just like he finished his work on the cross, he'll finish his work in us. Oh, we know those times where we have a well-intentioned act that backfires. What do we call that? Uh, we, oh, we, we say no good deed goes what? unpunished. Well, in God's kingdom, uh, as we know, there's only good deeds. Uh, the only good deed is not from us, right? It's, it's by God and by God's grace. Uh, Philippians 2, 6, and we see that no good deed, no good work goes unfinished. One day, the work will be completed, God's work in us uh, and through us as well. Uh, so Paul, when he, he, he goes to help his friends, these Philippian believers, uh, to help them to see, uh, to be reminded of God's work in them, uh, he shows it in, in a unique way with a prayer. Uh, he, he says, I have a deep affection for you guys. You know that. Same as the affection of Christ. Just like the same word there, that compassion that Jesus had when he saw those lost without a shepherd, those people uh, he saw him as lost without a shepherd, defeating the 5,000. He had a deep uh, affection, a deep compassion. Same word used here that Paul says, I have this deep affection for you. And my prayer for you, friends, is, he says uh, in verse 9, this is my prayer. Uh, after I have this great affection, um, even though you have all these opponents and challenges, I pray not that those challenges would be removed. That's not what he prays. He says, my, the one I... My dear friends, I pray that your love may abound. That your love may abound more and more. Not that everything would get easier. He says, I pray that your love would abound more and more. And how? How will it abound? By knowledge and depth of insight. By knowledge and depth of insight. Knowing God's word. We want to love God more and be reminded of his love more for us, know his word. 
And not just memorize it, right? The devil, he can memorize the gospel. He knows the whole Bible. He'd be pretty good at Bible trivia, don't you think? You want him on your team if you want to win the game. He'll, he'll, uh, he'll, he'll, he'll quote any verse. He'll know exactly where it's at, what address in the Bible and everything. He can memorize, but to know God's word uh, to, to, is not just to memorize. It's to apply it, to obey it. Uh, and now he says, that I pray that your love may abound in depth of insight and knowledge of not just hearing the word and knowing it in your minds, but applying it, applying it. Jesus said, uh, out of all God's word, the Bible, all the law and the prophets, they hang on these two commandments. What are they? Love God and love one another. Uh, you want to know love? You want to know God? Know his word and apply it. Simple as that. Know it and apply it. You want to be reminded of his work in you, that he's, one day it's going to be completed. Uh, know his word and see him working in you as you apply it to your life and be reminded there'll be one day where it's going to be fully completed. See, if, you, if you're here and you've never committed to Christ, and I give you every single explanation, uh, every answer that you have about the Christian faith, that won't do it. I mean, that's good. Uh, I can give you every answer, every explanation. I can, I can answer it to a T perfectly. But you won't know God. You won't know Jesus until you obey it. Until you repent and come to him and you trust in him and trust in his word. You won't know him until you apply. You can, you can know about him, yeah. But we, we don't really know him, uh, know God and his love uh, until we know his word and apply it and then Act upon it uh, in faith. And he says that, I, I, I pray that you do this. Dear friends, I pray that you, you grow in knowledge and depth of insight, insight. Why? So that you will be able to discern what is best. Right? Our friends want, want what's best for us, don't they? True friends do. And a true friend will get in your face and tell you, hey, you need to stop doing this because that's not best for you. That's actually really bad for you. But Paul says, I want, I want you to, to know God's word, to apply it to your life so you know what's best. That's what's best. So you can discern what is best. Uh, knowing God and, and making him known uh, and knowing his word is what is best for our lives. Uh, Paul knows that. And uh, when, he, when God convicts us through his word uh, and through the Holy Spirit, it's not so that we will change and then one day he can love us. No, he convicts us so that we can change and that, so that he, not so that he can love us, but because he loves us already. He wants us to know what life's all about. It's all about trusting Jesus, knowing his word, and applying it to our lives. And he says, you do this, and you will be pure and blameless. When? On the day of Christ. Now, that does not mean I have earned my salvation. That has, doesn't mean I've lived such a righteous, holy life that all of a sudden now I'm pure and blameless. No, it is knowing, being reminded of uh, that I, uh, as God's presence is being seen more in me, as I'm trusting him in his word, as I see his continued work in me, be reminded on the day of Christ that it's the work of Christ that has saved me and I am completely pure and I can be, my conscience can be clear before God because I'm trusting and I'm seeing his actual presence right now and uh, on that day, I don't have to worry, oh, am I saved? Am I, am I his or not? You're going to know for sure as you're trusting him and you're seeing him work in, in your life. Well, I want to end in a, with a story. Uh, there was an artist. Uh, I think it was during the Renaissance, 1500s. He was hired uh, to sculpt a statue for someone. And he orders all the necessary equipment. Uh, he... Uh, he orders also a giant, I mean, massive block of marble, a uh, heavy um, block of marble. And the guys that delivered it, the guys that brought this marble to his studio, I mean, they had, they had the hardest time loading it, unloading it, get it into position where, where the artist wanted it. And they're just cussing at each other. They're yelling at each other. They're sweating. They're just hating this piece of rock is what they called it. And they, one of them finally says, 
to the artist, why in the world did you want this ugly piece of rock anyhow? The artist's reply, he says, you see a big ugly rock. I see the young David who slayed Goliath. You come back in six months and you're going to see him too. The artist, Michelangelo. The statue, young David, as you see here. You may be looking in the mirror today, and you might just see a, a rock. Uh, you're not, you might just see, oh, I'm just a rock, but God sees a masterpiece. He sees a masterpiece because the greatest artist, he sees a masterpiece because he who began a good work, he will complete it. Uh, as we trust in him, as we trust in his word, applying by faith uh, God's word and being reminded of his continued presence and work in us. Uh, there's going to be a day where that work will be complete, that he who began the work will see that it is completed in Christ on the day when we see him in heaven. May that encourage us uh, to know him even more and make him known uh, so other people can one day be a masterpiece in heaven. Let's pray together. God, we thank you uh, that you came. You didn't come uh, because we have loved you or because we have earned your love, but you sent your son Jesus because you love us already. And uh, God, we thank you uh, that you made a way uh, that you started a work in us. And God, help us to, by faith, follow you and see that work get progressed now and perfected one day in heaven. And help us be reminded of that reality. Uh, one day we will be fully perfected in you. And God, I pray, God, that you would give us opportunity as we go from here uh, to lead other people to know you, as always, uh, to know of your grace and know of your love, uh, to know that you are the God uh, who does great work uh, and who's the only one that can forgive us of our sins uh, through the blood of Jesus. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.